And like David prayed, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I love babies. I especially love the smell of babies. You know, their plump little legs and cherub faces, the bright eyes and the cute smiles. What matters most to the parents through those tender years is that they, you know, eventually those babies grow up into adults and sometimes they lose their plump legs and they don't always retain the fat cheeks and the bright eyes or even the cute smiles. But you know, during those years, what is of extreme importance to the parents are some developmental markers. And they look forward to the first steps. And they especially look forward to the first words. And mothers will try to get them to say, Mama. And they're often disappointed that they say, Dada or Papa first. Ladies, there's a reason for that. And it has nothing to do with you. It's all science. God made it that way. You see, the P's and D's are easier to form in the mouth than the M's. And that's why they say Papa or Dada first. But you see, even in those, that, that little moment of joy, we realize that we are different from the parrot because we don't simply parrot speech. We actually can think about what we're going to say. We can speak and our words are powerful. We don't think about speaking, do we? We just do it. Where does speech begin? It actually physiologically begins in your stomach. When we take a deep breath in and the ear, we inhale and our diaphragm lowers and the rib cage expands and it pulls the air in to the lungs. And then we exhale and the process reverses itself. And as that air exits our lungs, it creates an air stream in the trachea. And then that air stream passes between our vocal cords, which causes them to vibrate. And depending upon how tense our lungs, those folds are. And that sound at this point, that ear makes, it sounds like a buzzing sound until it enters the mouth where tongue and teeth and jaw work together to express the thoughts of your mind. And this all happens in milliseconds. So much so that it seems automatic. So much so that parents get concerned when a child reaches a certain age and they don't speak. Well, we say something must be wrong with them. My niece was one of those kids. And she didn't talk for so she was she was about two and it was the babysitter who told my sister there's nothing wrong with her but her tongue needs to be clipped under her tongue it didn't extend all the way forward so she had a difficult time speaking so she had the surgery done and then i asked the surgeon could you put it back together because boy could she talk she was making up for lost time. Our words, Jesus warns us in our scripture reading. He tells us that out of the abundance of our heart, our mouth speaks. And in the same conversation, he's speaking to the Pharisees who had accused him of using the power of Satan to perform miracles. Jesus says, by our words, we will either be justified or condemned. Illustrating that our speech has a profound effect on shaping our eternal destinies. And this God-created, God-given ability to speak 
is unique to us as humans and is one of the most powerful tools we have. You and I were made in the image of God, after God's likeness. Consider for a moment that we open the Bible and one of the first things we learn about God is that he speaks. It says God and the Bible says in Genesis 1 and God said let there be light and there was light. Now think about that. God made audible an idea in his mind and the idea became a reality as soon as he spoken it. The psalmist puts it this way. It says for the word of the Lord is right. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He continues in the same Psalm 33. says, For he spake and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. You know, in creating, God spoke. For example, in creating the animals, God spoke to created things to the waters and to the earth to bring forth living creatures and it happened instantly. And notice in that creation story, one of the first things that God gave to Adam to do was to use the power of speech. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 19 and 20, there we read that God brought the animals to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called them, that was the name thereof. The use of speech is one way to exercise dominion over or authority over someone or something. Adam used his power of speech to express his joy at the creation of Eve, the woman that God had built for him, saying, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And interestingly enough, the first commandment given was not given in pantomime or charades, but it was spoken. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. We don't often think about the power of words, but consider for a moment. In less than 50 words, the course of history was changed forever. In Genesis chapter 3, the exchange between the serpent and Eve took 47 English words. Words are powerful, brethren. Be careful how you use them. You and I can do a lot. We will be a lot better off if we are more judicious in our speech because of the power of our words. For example... Look at the dialogue between the woman and the serpent in Genesis 3. Turn your Bibles, Genesis 3. Genesis 3 and verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Words. Just words. But are there just words? Here's the reality of the matter. By simply changing a word, we change the meaning of what God said. If you turn back to Genesis 2, verse 16 and 17, the Bible says, And the Lord God commanded whom? The man, saying, Of every tree of the garden, thou mayest freely eat. Now thou, in King James English, is a singular pronoun. Okay? Second person, singular. But the serpent comes to the woman and he asks her, ye, which is second person, plural. Subtle, but a big difference. Why? 
Because he is asking her to speak about something that she was not directly present for. We must be careful with our words. Our words have power. And you go through that dialogue between the woman and the serpent. And you realize then that not only did Eve answer in the plural when God spoke in the singular. But she also added to what was not said. By saying, neither shall we touch it, lest we die. And there Satan had the entrance that he needed. He says, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day that you eat thereof, you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. If only Eve had thought a little more carefully before she spoke. And there are many verses in scripture warning us about the danger of speaking without thinking. James, the brother of Jesus, in his epistle, James chapter 3, says this. If any man offends not in word, the same is a, what kind of man? Perfect man and able to bridle the whole body. In other words, if we can control our tongues, we can control ourselves. James goes on to write in James 3, verse 6, he says, The tongue is a fire. Is fire a good thing or a bad thing? Huh? Both, huh? It's a good thing when we use it for cooking, right? Or brush clearing. But what happens when fire is out of control? Destruction, right? James continues, James chapter 3, verse... Here we go, verse 10. Out of the same mouth proceeded blessings and cursings. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. You know, the same lips that kiss also gossip. The same mouth that invites you home for lunch also ends friendships. The voice that inspires also incites. So how are you using your words? Are you blessing or cursing? Are you helping or hurting? You know, Solomon writes in Proverbs chapter 26, verse 20, where there is no wood, the fire goes out. And where there is no tail bearer, the strife ceases. Turn to Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 to 19. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. The Bible says, These six things of the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. Do you notice that half of those things have to do with what comes out of our mouth? Brothers and sisters, you and I are called to speak graciously. Paul says that our words should be seasoned with salt so that we will know how to answer every man. And every offering presented in the sanctuary of all had to be salted so that it would be acceptable. We need to have God season our words with his grace to flow out of us when we speak. So that we will deal with others in the same gracious manner in which God has dealt with us. Consider the power of Jesus' words as he hung on the cross. There he is dying between two thieves. 
and one dying thief utters, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus says to that penitent thief, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And those words offered hope and healing to a man who only moments earlier was surely facing eternal separation from his creator. God stopped dying long enough to speak words of life to a dying thief. And as followers of Christ, you and I are charged with the mandate to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. This Seventh-day Adventist church was called into existence to prophesy again to many peoples and nations and tongues and kings, Revelation 10 and 11. We are called out of darkness into God's marvelous light of surrender to his lordship. And then in turn, we are commanded to share those virtues with those who are still in the dark. You know, one of the virtues of Christianity is prayer. Ellen White writes, Gospel Workers, page 34, 35, and he also, is also repeated in Steps of Christ, page 93. Prayer is the opening of heart, the heart to God as to a friend. But prayer requires words. This past Wednesday night, we learned that prayer is able to save men from death, both physical and spiritual. Think about it, brothers and sisters. Your words are powerful. Choose carefully what you say. You know, a single word can make such a difference in the lives of many people. I may have told you this story before. But in 2005, standing in the airport in Johannesburg, waiting to catch a flight to Madagascar, waiting for my friends to, to get to the airport, I realized we would have a dilemma, and that dilemma would be this. We left the U.S. more than 24 hours ago. We should choose carefully what we say. When we call children stupid and they do stupid things, why are we surprised? Teachers, your words can either crush hope or create hope in the lives of your students. The power of a rightly spoken word can impact the world like a pebble dropped in a pond. You know, I have been stabbed. I have been slashed. I have torn the tendons and ligaments in this left hand of mine. I've been struck in the head by the rock. And the pain for each of those was intense. Probably one of the most painful things I had was having the pins removed out of my hand. Because that was done without anesthesia. It's like having five toothaches at the same time. But you know, those scars heal and they don't hurt. But I have scars in my inner person 40 years or more, still raw. I'm sure some of you do too. I would be stupid to think that there are not things here that still hurt because we believed in all lies. Sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never harm me. But I want to tell you this morning that many of you who are hurting, I know you're hurting because of words spoken to you or about you. But the question is, will you repeat this behavior with others? The Apostle Paul writes to us in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23. I read a, to, to Ephesians 5, I'll read a few verses from there and then we'll close. Ephesians chapter 4, Paul writing, he says this. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, put away lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one of another. 
And be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. You know, brothers and sisters, I'm going to close with a ap simple appeal to you and to me that we should look inwardly. Allow God to search our hearts and our minds. Have I spoken words this week that have broken relationships? Have I spoken words that have pierced like arrows into the hearts of the hearers? Is somebody not here this morning because of something that was said? Is there someone here who you need to speak wonderful words of life to? That's my appeal to you and to me. To ask God to, to take control of our minds and by, thereby of our tongues. Maybe as a parent, you need to say sorry to a child. Or a child may need to say sorry to a parent for words spoken. Ill time, unkind words spoken at the wrong time, in the wrong place, in the wrong manner. Because ultimately, brothers and sisters, we all have the ability to speak. But I want you to realize that your words have power, influence. So be careful what you say. Because as we read, death and life are in the power of the tongue. You know, it's easy for us to be offended by words. My prayer for you, for me this week, is that if we hear somebody speaks unkindly to us, that we will give them the benefit of the doubt. That we will, we will try to find the positive in what they're trying to say. You know, it's, you got to be careful. And also... When it comes to electronic communication, be careful what you say and be careful how you read what is sent to you. Meaning, sometimes our fingers don't move as fast as our brains or they move faster than our brains. But God is showing me that as a church, we really need to get over ourselves. And I pray that this week the Lord will help us to see the better in each other. And just, if anybody, like we just sang, Lord, teach me that to do or die is to be like Jesus. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, you have given us this wonderful gift, the ability to speak. The ability to share thoughts, to express emotions. But Lord, except we surrender our hearts to you, Lord, that which should be a blessing is a curse. So help us, Lord, to be careful in our words. Help us to think the best of others. And help us, Lord, to give each other the benefit of the doubt. Help us to take our injustices and our hurts and our griefs to you and allow you, Lord, to instruct us in what to say. Lord, may we respond rather than react. It's my prayer in Jesus' name.